Okay, guys, welcome to part two. So when we left off, we're talking about the community era policing, uh, which began in the 1980s and is still functioning today. Now, most law enforcement agencies have gone to some form of community policing, and there is really no standard definition for community policing. So every agency, depending on their needs of the community, uh, may have a different approach to what they deem as community policing. But nonetheless, uh, law enforcement in the United States now is in what we call this community era or community policing era of policing. Now, unlike some of the others where, um, you know, like in the political era, the authorization came from politics. And in the reform era, it came from the law and professionalism. Um, and under community policing or community problem solving era, the authorization comes from a combination of areas, uh, not just professionalism and the law, but also community support. So it's essential for law enforcement today to maintain that level of community support. Now this will come, uh, uh, have a more important meaning uh, several modules from now when we talk about this whole idea of sanctuary cities, sanctuary states, and uh, the ability and role of law enforcement, local law enforcement, in this era of community policing, uh, while at the same time uh, dealing with this issue of immigration. And so, uh, so just keep that in mind as, uh, like I said, in probably module five or module six, this is gonna be one of our research and uh, writing assignments. But community policing uh, during this period of time is really taken hold. And again, uh, most law enforcement agencies from probably moderate to large size have probably some level of community policing divisions or department uh, to help address and work with the community in, in solving uh, many of the issues that are facing communities today. Uh, the function again here is crime control, crime prevention, and problem solving. And problem solving is the new thing. Um, so, we're asking our employees to be more problem solvers. In other words, trying to evaluate why certain crimes occur in certain parts of the city and what can we do about that uh, and how do we go about addressing that. Um, so, for example, um, when I was working for the city of Ontario, which is in Southern California, we're about 30, 35 miles east of Los Angeles, and we are pretty much where the 10 and 15 freeways meet. So if you ever travel through Southern California, the 10 freeways east-west runs across from you know Santa Monica all the way to the east coast. Uh, the 15 freeway runs from uh, San Diego all the way through Idaho. So where the 15 and uh, 10 freeways meets, a very very busy uh, interchange, and there's two large truck stops there. We had two of the largest truck stops west of the Mississippi there, and so we obviously had problems there, and so we went to this community policing era and began to strategize on how can we reduce crime at both these locations. And often they were dealing with vice and, you know, some robberies and an array of other things. Uh, so we used problem solving strategies. So community policing uh, clearly has a place in law enforcement because the goal here is to reduce or eliminate those common problems within communities. And if you can alleviate those or reduce those, uh, then the community is safer and people feel safer and people engage more with their neighbors and it goes on and on. All right, so that was the function. The organizational design for community policing uh, as a police organization is, again, you're looking at decentralization. In other words, uh, decision-making should go down to the lowest level. So officers and supervisors working community policing in a particular area of the community should be able to make decisions regarding um, proper actions based on their problem solving uh, abilities and how you're going about resolving an issue uh, in that segment of the community. So it's decentralized. Decision making is decentralized. Uh, in other words, the chief doesn't make the decision as to whether or not we're going to do X, Y, or Z. We tend to leave that to line personnel and typically first line supervisors and maybe their lieutenants that are involved. But it, again, it's, it's decentralized. 
we find out the use of task forces increases and then you can use some matrices in terms of uh, developing your strategies and determining whether or not those strategies that you've developed are in fact working. So if you put some strategies into place, did it mitigate the crime problem? Did it mitigate whatever problem you're dealing with? If so, then in theory, you're successful. Um, if it didn't, then we need to come up with a different strategy. That's all. It doesn't mean that we failed. It just means we need to develop a different strategy. The relationship to the environment or the community at, during this period, during the community policing era or community problem solving era, is consultative. Uh, the police defend the values of law and professionalism, but listen to community concerns. In other words, we engage more with the community on developing ideas and strategies on how to solve a specific community problem. Uh, oftentimes, the people that live in the neighborhood that's being affected by whatever's taking place have some wonderful ideas. And so it's up to us to foster those relationships, build those relationships, and address those issues that are worthy. Um, and like I said, sometimes the best solutions come from members of the community themselves. So that's the important part there. We are consultative. Uh, we, we, we're working in a partnership mode. Uh, the demands channeled through analysis of underlying problems. So in other words, what we're looking at now in terms of how we're solving problems is not by uh, a dispatch center sending us to a call. We go out and handle the call. And then when the call is done, we go to the next call. Okay, that was part of the reform era. In the community era or community policing era, we look through data, we look through analysis and trying to figure out what is the underlying problem. So we look at data, we look at information, we go out and look around communities and try to figure out what's going on, try to figure out what we can do to alleviate whatever the problems are uh, taking place. All right. So that is part of um, how we go about solving things now uh, through analysis and evaluating underlying problems. Tactics and technology, in other words, what do we use to help um, address the community issues during this era is uh, we find that we've gone back to levels of foot patrol or bike patrol, some level that gets that intimacy, that relationship back between the police and the community. That one-on-one -on -one interaction that we had in the political era, we're now applying some of that here in the community policing era. Problem solving tools. What can we do and how can we address the community's problems? And, and those are paramount. So we're using a different set of tactics and technology as we try to develop strategies to resolve community problems and make neighborhoods safer, make sections of the community safer. Because if you do that, then the people will will engage in the community more. Uh, they'll have faith in their local government and their police department. And so that's that's what's critical. So again, community policing is uh, part of the, the community era and it's problem solving, working with the community and being able to serve uh, them and address the needs that are occurring within a spe specific neighborhood within um, your, your community. Uh, the outcome, finally, is what you're looking for is, is better quality of life for your community and citizen satisfaction, right? And so those are important. And I, and I can tell you, um, having been a police chief, that the issues that commu a community raises, uh, I have not had people complain about the number of robberies in town or burglaries. I have had people complain an awful lot about quality of life issues, uh, speeding cars, uh, drug dealings. Um, maybe prostitution, uh, juvenile issues, underage drinking, okay? Those are quality of life issues. And so people are really interested in law enforcement addressing those quality of life issues because that's what has a tendency to bring down their neighborhood. And then it leads to this whole broken windows theory, which you'll learn about, uh, I think, in your readings. Uh, but nonetheless, um, the, the important part here and, and the key thing here in terms of outcome is the quality of life uh, benefit and citizen satisfaction that comes with the community era. Okay, so those are the three eras. We had the political era, reform era, and now community era or community policing era. It's called a couple of different things. All right, now let me just touch on real quick again this idea of the rule of law 
because this is going to become an important concept in um, future writing assignments. So it's, it's important to understand how the rule of law applies to uh, our criminal justice system. Um, and I'll give you an example of the rule of law at the end, at the end of this PowerPoint. So let's look at a couple of different questions. Uh, let, what is the rule of law? We talked about this before, but the rule of law means that laws apply equally to everyone in a democracy, which is what we live in. Even the most powerful government officials and elected leaders. It also means that laws are created through a predetermined, open, transparent process, not by the whim of the most powerful members of society. All right, so laws are created by our legislators and legislators are elected by the people. So by default, we create rules, we create our own laws, and we do that through our elected leaders, all right? So why is the rule of law important to a democracy? Citizens, as citizens, we respect the laws because they are clearly communicated and fairly enforced. So laws are clearly communicated and fairly enforced. Everyone is held accountable to the same laws, and those laws protect our fundamental rights and those fundamental rights are outlined in the Constitution and specifically the Bill of Rights, which uh, you learned a little bit about last week um, on the Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth Amendments. This is the foundation of the rule of law in the United States, right? So again, um, we're all accountable to the same laws and those laws protect our fundamental rights. And those are our constitutional rights as again outlined in the Bill of Rights. And so we expect criminal justice professionals to follow the rule of law, all right, in terms of investigating crimes, prosecuting criminals, punishing individuals, we expect them to follow the basic rule of law. What are the main features of the rule of law? It requires measures to ensure adherence to the principles of, of supremacy of law, equality before the law, accountability to the law, fairness in the application of the law, the idea of separation of powers, which we talked about last week, participation in decision-making, legal certainty, avoidance of arbitrariness, and procedural and legal transparency. So that's the main features of the rule of law. What is an example of the rule of law? An example of the rule of law is the freedom of the press, which is the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution found in the Bill of Rights. That's an example of the rule of law. All right, and so you now hopefully have a better idea as to, you know, what is the rule of law, why, is, why it's important, what are the main features, and I've just given you an example. Okay, so this will become important again um, as we continue along uh, when you get ready to do your one of your first project assignments, which is the more in-depth writing assignment. Concepts such as the rule of law, the Bill of Rights, the Constitution will all come into play, as will uh, the idea of the evolution of policing in this country uh, and what are the English and colonial um, contributions to our modern day criminal justice system and um, law enforcement. Uh, and I've given you some ideas here with Sir Robert Peel, right? So um, when I post this lecture this week, I will also post some resources for you guys. So feel free to use those. I think they will help you as you work on some of our future assignments that are coming up. Um, uh, I'll put these in outline form um, so they're there for you as a resource, okay? I think that's it, guys, and have a great module week. And if you need anything, kindly let me know. Thank you so much.